meanwhile, we will move on to the next presentation, and uh, Emmanuel, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Bernard. Good evening, everybody. And we will discuss about, um, again, fluid management. And I must admit, at, at least for the beginning of the, the discussion, that I'm quite confused about uh, um, most of the literature we had these past 10 or 20 years, because most of the debate in the last 20 years, at least, was mainly focused on the less or more approach. We should give less or more fluids, either less or more vasopressor, less or more blood, less or more oxygen. And in fact, I don't know if this um, overwhelmed literature can explain why in clinical practice we have such a viability. But at least in fact, when we observe in clinical practice what people do, what physicians do, we must admit that there is a very significant variability in the amount of fluid which are administered to patient. And for example, if you look at a very common procedure like colectomy, for example, you can see that some patient will receive something around six milliliter per kilogram of crystalloids, while at the same time, other patient will receive more than 20 milliliter per kilogram. So we don't know why there is such a viability in clinical practice. I don't know if uh, it's because of the literature, which was not uh, very uh, helpful, but in fact, there is a very large viability in practice. And finally doctors, and we don't know exactly how to do and how to perform uh, fluid management in daily practice. And I'm quite co convinced that we have to go back to the physiology and remember that, of course, if you give insufficient amount of fluids, we will create the condition of hypoperfusion. If you give too much fluid, we will create the condition of fluid excess. And both hypoperfusion and fluid excess can lead to significant morbidity in patients. So we have to keep that in mind. And obviously, this will create the condition of postoperative morbidity because you can recreate exactly the same thing in real life. If you give insufficient amount of fluids for a very common non-cardiac surgical procedure, you will have an increase in complication, for example, postoperative respiratory complication, but also postoperative acute kidney injury. And it's exactly the same if you give uh, excessive amount of fluid, obviously, the increase in complication is found when you give uh, too much fluid in your patient. So again, we have to go back to physiology. Can, can we go back yeah. to your slide, which is exciting, because yeah. in the U-curve on the right side, the post-operative acute kidney injury, yeah. I understand your point, when you give too much, yeah. dangerous. But we don't give enough. Yeah. Dangerous too. Yeah. So that's the, the difficulty we have. Exactly. And we found exactly the same thing in some very recent paper, for example, the, the relief trial, uh, who found that a restrictive approach, a too restrictive approach of fluid management during very common surgical procedure, abdominal procedure, was associated with an increase in postoperative acute kidney injury. So too less is bad. Too much is obviously dangerous, but the, um, the margin of safety finally is very tight. So we have to, to do better. And to do better is to remember that fluid loading is of fluid therapy or fluid or drugs. And as any kind of drugs, we have to keep in mind that drugs should be administered, reminding that there is a dose, a duration, and obviously time when the de-escalation is needed. And for example, for the fluid challenge, we have to keep in mind that we have to target a specific goal. And the goal for uh, the administration of fluid cannot be an increase in uh, arterial pressure. Because in some patients, for example, even if cardiac output increase with fluid, you can have an increase in arterial pressure, but in other cases, for example, you can observe also a decrease in arterial pressure during fluid loading, even if cardiac output increase. So the, the response to fluid cannot be uh, targeted, targeted on arterial pressure. You, we have to focus more on uh, cardiac output because finally, the objective of fluid therapy is obviously to increase the preload. And we hope that this increase in return, venous return will uh, be responsible for an increase in cardiac output. But the final point is to correct tissue hypoperfusion in patients suffering from insufficient perfusion. And in th these cases, we have to focus on 
perfusion. And one of the target could be to trigger uh, or to uh, have a look to oxygen delivery in our uh, patients. So I don't, I don't think that we can propose only one target value because this was uh, the question uh, we asked uh, this, mo this uh, afternoon. It's um, a bundle. I, I'm quite convinced that it's a bundle. And when you give fluid, and it's probably the same for other drugs, the final response should be either an increase uh, in oxygen delivery related to the, the need of the patients and related to the oxygen consumption. One um, of the point is to give fluids, obviously, but the, the response to fluid will be positive only in case of uh, an increase in the venous return. And if this, there is an increase in venous return, we expect from fluid also to increase stroke volume and cardiac output and finally oxygen delivery. But in other uh, circumstances, the response could be also blood because if oxygen delivery is insufficient, one of the, um, the, the cause can be uh, a low uh, arterial content. So maybe in some cases, blood can be a good option, not only fluid. And finally, if fluids are not enough, in if the patient does not need blood, vasoactive drugs can obviously be uh, the option. And you have to decide if you prefer to increase cardiac output using inotropes. In some circumstances, it, it can be useful. In other uh, circumstances, it can be to increase arterial pressure using vasopressure. So again, it's very difficult to propose only one target. And you have to keep in mind all these targets all together. And if you have these targets in mind, probably you will give the right treatment to the right patients. And again, I'm quite convinced that there are no uh, only um, no unique targets and obviously no, uh, on no only one value that will uh, fit all patients. So again, my opinion, but we can discuss about that, is that we need more uh, individualization. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. But if I go back to, to the physiology, uh, I understand that our aim is to improve oxygen delivery to tissues which means uh, having a good flow with enough pressure and, of course, bringing saturated hemoglobin to the tissues. Um, when we place an IV in our patient, like we do every day, yep. the result of that action is to put some fluids, which goes mainly into the veins, yep. because the veins contain a large proportion of the blood, so our infusion goes mainly into the veins, mm -hmm. where it increases venous return to the heart, and if the heart is able to respond to this increase in venous return, flow is increasing. Yep. How do you explain that for so many years, everyone is focused on the arterial pressure and nobody is looking at the flow? Yeah, Whereas yeah. the first effect of fluids is to increase flow. You are perfectly right. Uh, probably because arterial pressure is very commonly used in practice, while at the same time, cardiac output was not measured or is not measured. So um, probably we, we need to have more uh, easier tools to assess or to evaluate cardiac output because for so many people, cardiac output is very difficult to evaluate. But in fact, we all know that we can evaluate the response to fluids on cardiac output using very simple way. And I perfectly endorse your view. Um, we need to evaluate the response to fluid, not on cardiac output, but on uh, not on uh, arterial pressure, sorry, but on cardiac output, not obviously, yeah. Okay. Which doesn't mean that we should not take great care of arterial pressure. It is a very important yeah, yeah, target. Of but fluids affect flow, and we should look at flow when we give fluids. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's why th these are two um, not two uh, not opposite uh, targets, but complementary, complementary targets. And again, you're right. If you give fluid, it's because you want to increase flow. And if you want to increase pres pressure, you have to give other drugs, vasopressor or other type of drugs. But if you want to increase pressure, it's not with fluids. Not necessary with fluids. Yeah. That's a very, very important point you make. 
And I think that this is to be very clear, honestly, by ourselves, that we use pressure instead of flow because there are so many reasons. Some are good, some are not so good. Anyway, if we have the flow, something which is remarkable for me too is to see that with the same amount of volume we give to the patients, A and B, 100 cc's or 250, whatever, we generate in relatively healthy people so different response in flow. Some is moving multiplying by two, the other one is multiplying by four. And we don't know why, except that maybe the time for the circulation is shorter. Yeah. And then if you are going shorter from the LV to the LV, with the same amount of volume reducing the time, you get a higher flow. And we don't care about this time of circulation too much. What is your, 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 your vision of that? Obviously, I fully agree with you, and I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I don't have the response to, to for, for, for this problem, but you, again, you're right. Yeah, we don't care about that, and it's a very important point. Yeah. I think the point that Didier mentioned that the response to fluid is extremely variable, even in a homogeneous population. You cannot predict what's yeah. going to happen. So if you do not measure, you are absolutely blind to what's going to happen. And if you are blind, you, are, you may make mistakes. You may give too much and generate congestion. You may give not enough and leave your patient uh, yeah. Hypovolemic. And, and more importantly, you, re you reproduce the, your mistake. So, Absolutely. <laughs> so it is also important to, to, to emphasize the fact that the idea of uh, trying to obtain the best possible flow has been validated and developed in patients going into the OR. It's not, it does not work in critical care patients, in ICU patients. So targeting the optimal flow for the duration of the surgery is certainly a safe and effective uh, goal, but in, in the ICU it's completely different. So we don't have to try to, to maximize the flow in patients in the ICU for sure. Olivier, you wanted to make a comment on, on that? Or you no, yes. Uh, effectively, it's, it's interesting to see that we have clearly to separate the operating room and the ICU. Uh, yeah. the, the patients are completely different. Most of the patients in operating room have a standard normal hemodynamic. And probably optimize the hemodynamic for this patient is, is good to avoid hypovolemia and so on. But in ICU, most of the patients received at least one, two, three, li three liters in, in the uh, emergency department or in the first step of uh, resuscitation. And for these patients, it's probably more important to limit fluid overload, probably, and to have the, the best uh, U-curve for them uh, than optimization, because probably optimization uh, has already been done uh, first. And now uh, we have a lot of parameters to take into account, uh, the cardiac function and so on, because the, the, the patient is not uh, LC before uh, it's probably yeah. septic and so on. Absolutely, yeah. So we clearly uh, yeah. the amount of fluid should be uh, individualized and probably uh, guided by stroke volume of flow measurement. Marc Olivier? There is perhaps a, a big difference too in ICU because there is uh, frequently uh, vascular dysfunction with, uh, which uh, increase the uh, uh, complexity of the uh, fluid administration uh, and the uh, targets for us. Yeah. Maybe we should also emphasize the fact that uh, during the recent years, a lot, a lot of improvement has been made about f tools to measure flow. It's becoming easier and easier to measure flow. For a long time, we could only acquire pressure easily in our patient. But these days, we have many different tools. So there is a variety of, uh, of techniques, and uh, we have no time to go over this. But clearly, this is something that facilitates the access to flow measurements. Yeah, and probably in ICU, the patient have... Uh, a vascular leakage yeah. with uh, 
the, the, the fluid filling is not in the vessels and go uh, outside. And it's probably the, the most important problem to, to evaluate. Uh. Yes, and, and you can also create vascular leak if you give too much fluid also in the operating room. So also, yeah. Yeah.